Enzymes. If I wanted to make some of the components to make a whole new you in the lab, I'd find myself having a pretty hard time. I'd need lots of chemicals and high temperatures and just really long reaction times. If my body had to rely on exactly the same reactions, I wouldn't exist. And while that may be a good thing, if we're to survive, our bodies need to be able to do chemical reactions quickly, effectively and at normal temperatures which don't end in catastrophe. The secret to this ability is enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts, i.e. they're catalysts made by organisms. A catalyst, if you remember, is something that enables a chemical reaction to proceed at a lower activation energy and therefore a faster rate without being used up. In short, enzymes enable reactions to happen in life faster and with less energy without being consumed themselves. So how do enzymes achieve this? They rely on really specific shapes. Enzymes are proteins that configure themselves into some rather snazzy configurations. Each enzyme has what is known as an active site. This is where the chemical reactions actually occur, and this is highly specific. Each chemical reaction that happens in your body will have an enzyme that only does that reaction and won't work for other reactions. They're like specialist doctors, they get really good at treating one specific thing and then do it over and over. You can tell this because the enzyme's name dictates their reaction. For instance, proteases react on proteins, carbohydrases react on carbohydrates, and lipases lack on, uh, react on lipids. The shape of the active site is really crucial to this. The reacting molecule, which is called the substrate, fits it like Cinderella's slipper, except ignoring the fact that there's probably many people at the ball which had the same size feet, but just imagine it's kind of perfect. This match between the substrate and the enzyme is called the lock and key theory. Enzymes are also pretty fussy so-and-sos. This highly specific reaction ability depends on the beautiful match between the substrate and the active site, and that can be disrupted. As such, enzymes will work best in a certain set of conditions. Most exam questions will involve identifying the optimum conditions for a certain enzyme, or looking at how it's been disrupted. The two main factors we need to account for are temperature and pH. If I was to draw a graph of enzyme activity and how it varies with temperature, I'd see three main phases. It starts off with low activity at low temperatures. This is because the particles don't have much energy, and so there aren't many successful collisions and reactions. As the temperature increases, the rate also increases. This is because the particles now have enough energy to react. The enzyme will reach an optimum temperature where the activity of the enzyme starts to decrease afterwards. This is because the vibrating and the energy that the particles involve start to disrupt that highly specific shape, that highly specific active site that we've been talking about. The enzyme will then start to be called, uh, start to become denatured. And this is a disruption of the shape. The pH graph is much simpler. Each enzyme has a best pH, and if the pH is too low or too high, the active site is disrupted or denatured, and as such, the reaction doesn't occur effectively. It's like the biological equivalent of Goldilocks. Everything just has to be just right. In summary, enzymes are protein biological catalysts that control almost every reaction in you. They have specific operating conditions in terms of temperature and pH because they rely on the specific shape of their active site. If it's not right, it's denatured.